Nice. We are, we are, we are now live. And okay, here we go. Good okay, morning. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Nice. Good morning to everybody who is watching us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. No, not later. So we know that everybody is mm. getting ready for work or already commuting. And uh, because of this knowledge, we are even more appreciative of uh, your being with us. Today we have uh, once again James Howell, uh, one of our very special guests, guest speakers. Uh, he's going to be with us um, uh, and talk about uh, auctionable tips. Uh, for sales messages and uh, emails today. So um, we hope that uh, you will get a lot of uh, tips from him today. And uh, we have prepared uh, some um, visuals here as well. Uh, so stick with us on LinkedIn. Also stick with us on um, uh, YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you with you, uh, James, today. So please, mm -hmm. yes, uh, please. Uh, uh, okay, the floor is yours. I'm sorry. Just <laughs> No, it's great. That's yes. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm excited. To, uh, it's so nice to be able to do this and actually see you while while we're presenting. Usually, I'm kind of over top of my phone, and uh, which which you know has its own charm. But in the, here, I can actually see you and, and talk to you. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, well, even before we get started, I mean, Tim and Maya, are you uh, how how are you doing today? Are you are you feeling good? Feeling excited? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I always look forward to your talks. Um, cool, and uh, especially the topic because uh, I agree it seems like a tough nut to crack. So, yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to do it. We really appreciate it. Oh yeah, uh, no problem. I mean, I've done a lot of sales training, and and this is a topic that I think I, I remember the first time I came on, I mentioned how sales skills I think can really be applied to almost every aspect of your life. And I really do think that if you can get good at writing concise, effective messages, uh, especially to people that you don't know, and that's going to be the the focus of what we're going to be doing today is, you know, reaching out to people that you generally don't know, which is almost can sound a little bit spammy, which I'm going to talk about. I'm not talking about spam, just to be super clear. I'm not talking about spam, but it's a great skill to be able to have. Um, I'm going to go over some of the things that you can use this skill for. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if you can just get in touch with people who don't know you and have those people be willing to give up their most important resource, which isn't their money, it's their time. Like that is a huge skill if, if you're able to, to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to share some of these things with you. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's start immediately. Yeah. Yeah, yes. absolutely. So uh, go ahead and pull up the, the first slide if you'd like there, and then we can start going through. I mean, the, the challenge with uh, cold, I, I call it cold messaging, by the way. Cold messaging is essentially reaching out to somebody who you don't know. It's cold because there is no warm relationship there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I, I did do a, a slightly longer workshop on this earlier this year. So this might, there might be some folks who have already seen some of these things and might be a bit of a refresher for them. But um, hopefully they, they, it'll entice them to put it to good use. Uh, but the, the real challenge is, and I think that we all know this, is that we just all get so many emails. And I would say that actually even at this point, if you're fairly active on something like LinkedIn, you probably also get quite a few messages from people on LinkedIn who perhaps you don't know. Uh, maybe they're trying to sell you something. Maybe you know it's some, something else that's going on. But basically, we're inundated with messages. And as it says here, you're going to find tons of different uh, um, statistics on this, but the average person gets around 121 emails per day. And at least 50% of that is considered spam. Um, I personally, in my Gmail inbox, I don't really even look in the promotions or the spam folder anymore, because I just know that it is almost certainly going to be <laughs> garbage. I can see Tim. Uh, do, do you ever look in there, Tim? Not anymore. I used to. It was a waste of time. I just let it roll in there, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And sure. I mean, and actually, even now, this has been going on around the world. I think it was in 2008 that Japan started their anti-spam uh, legislation, which basically means that if you haven't opted in to get a message, it's illegal to send somebody um, ad mail, what they call ad mail. Uh, mm -hmm. 
this is also very recently, it, a similar law has been around in Canada, where I'm from, and in the United States and Europe for um, quite a long time. But Gmail has actually just come out that they are going to be upping the restrictions for emailing. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that's going to be happening. Yeah, there was some recent news that came out going to be happening in 2024, where if you're sending what are called bulk emails, where you send out tons of emails at once, um, that uh, they're going to be restricting those. So end of the day, <clears throat> the biggest challenge is that most emails get ignored. <clears throat> in fact, I would say that most messages, you know, get ignored uh, in your LinkedIn. If you, you obviously have your regular messages and then there's like the messages from people that you don't know, which almost certainly you, you look at them and immediately you can just kind of tell that this is not <laughs> going to be an email that's kind of worth my time. And that's where I say that we've all developed this thing without even really realizing it, which is the email sixth sense. You remember this movie? I, I saw this movie as a kid and it completely yeah. terrified me. Uh, <laughs> but the, the email, oh, it's super creepy. Yeah. The, the email sixth sense though, is that we can sense when we receive an email that has been sent to thousands of people, you know, or, or even I would say potentially even less, maybe like 50 or a hundred people. Like, we could just sense, oh, mm -hmm. this is a spam email, you know, and we don't even have to open it. You can just look at, usually at the subject line and you can look at the first few letters and or the few, first few words. You're not really even consciously thinking about it, but you're like, this is spam. Right. Ignore, 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 ignore. Yeah. yeah. So my kind of premise is that because of that, because we have that sixth sense, there's actually a big opportunity if you apply, you know, some skills or some new skills or some new tactics to cold messaging and cold emailing. Okay. There really is this, this opportunity to stand out from the crowd. And that is what these actionable tips and tricks are, are going to be about is basically just being able to send that email to someone who doesn't know you, but have that person basically do a double take and be like, oh, uh, you know, this is actually a uh, potentially, you know, something that I should, I should look into. It's not going to work every time, to be clear. These are not silver bullets. They don't work every single time, but right. it's going to vastly increase your, your uh, chances. And I, I want to mention a few ways to use these. And I have used these extensively for every one of these reasons. OK, first one is if you work in business. All right. It's great. And especially, you know, I know uh, here in Japan, a very common way for business to build. And, and this is the same in, in most other places is through referrals. Right. If it's like, hey, have you met Tim? He's, you know, does X, Y, Z. He's a good guy. Would you, would you be open to me to connect you with him or something like that? Um, I know that that's the most common way for business to grow. And that's great. I think that that probably would be more effective than cold email. At the same time, we don't always have that opportunity. There, we don't always have those connections to those particular places. And I want you, if you have a business, I want you to imagine just your dream client. Like the, the client where you're like, I know that if I can sit down with these people, I would have a good conversation with them. And they might be, I, I know that I can probably solve a problem for them. I can do something for them that would make a difference in their business. Like mm -hmm. think about those people that you maybe don't have access to. Okay. Right. That is, that is what this can be used for. I don't know. Maya, do you, do you have anyone, I, you know, I'm not saying to say who it is, but do you have any kind of businesses in your mind that you would just, you know, that if you could just chat with them, you'd yes, probably I be do. able to have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. I do, in fact, but it is so difficult for me, you know, to get uh, this, to get my mind or beyond this uh, obstacle in my mind that I can reach out and just say, okay, so this is, you know, what I do. And, uh, uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, why don't you have a look, uh, you know, at our uh, website or something like that? So yeah. it's really difficult. It's a barrier which I'm still struggling to get over. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, I, that is such a normal, normal feeling to have or a thought to have. Um, and I think that because of that, sometimes we can send emails in a particular way that uh, we almost feel like we are 
needing to like prove that, hey, it, this is going to be worth your time to, to have this conversation. Um, I'm, I've certainly been like that many, many times where I've written these long emails and I'm going to send you an example in a sec, um, or I'm going to show you an example in a sec where mm -hmm. I almost do feel like I'm, I'm trying to convince them in some way in this email that like, hey, it's, it's worth it to have this conversation with me now. Um, an another, another reason to use cold email and messaging, connecting with an important person. I've used this to, I mean, I, I love rock climbing. I've, I've used this to reach out to people who have started like big rock climbing companies that I want to talk to, you know, that I maybe want to interview. I have a podcast that's about rock climbing history. So, you know, reaching out to those people who are CEOs of these companies and something that's going to, hey, catch their attention and maybe I can talk with them, interview them. I've also used this actually when I was living in Vancouver because at the time I was really into disc golf which I know is very obscure, but like literally Frisbee golf. And oh. I wanted a new course to be built. So I messaged a bunch of counselors and I got responses from tons of them. I was able to have some meetings to try and get this new disc golf course built. Um, and then of course, the last one, as I mentioned, landing interviews. I mean, this is, I think, one of the most un or few lesser used ways that really should be used if you want to get an interview at a company that you're super interested in, instead mm -hmm. of applying through the regular channels, going through an application, sending a targeted email to the future boss that you want to have about why maybe they should sit down and have a cup of coffee with you, you know? Um, so a few ways that you can use these, uh, this message or, or these types of messages uh, and these skills. So, I'm going to show you a example. And by the way, I'm not making any comment about this person's business or whether or not it's a good business or not a good business. I've, I've written emails like this before, but this was mm -hmm. sent to a person who I used to work with. And to me, this is just a classic example of a sale of a sales email that I personally sent emails like this. I sent them for a long time. And after maybe five years ago, when I changed my tactics, I started sending different a different style, which I'm going to share with you in a second, made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. But and, and obviously, I've redacted all of the specific information in here. But this type of email is extremely common. And for me, this is the type of email that when we see it in our inbox from time to time, we're like, OK, I'm, yeah, I'm going to unless I absolutely have that very, very specific need at that exact moment, which, you know, this could work in those instances. I'm probably not going to be eager to have a conversation with this person. And I might just completely ignore the email. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the yeah. first thing that I'll mention, sorry, what were you going to say, Maya? Oh, no, no. I'm just looking, you know, it's, uh, well, that's the first line on top there and also the second one. And uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> It takes time to read, first of all. But, but I, I feel I have felt the pain that you're describing. I like, yeah. Ah. You know, so I understand. <laughs> yeah. I, mm. And, you know, one of the first things that I'll, I'll mention about this email, and again, this is, I know it has good intention, but like starting off with, hi, Paul, you know, so and so, and I am the founder of this company. And basically, this is what we do. And, you know, it's just about them, 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 a little bit more about them and a little bit more about them. And it's basically just talking about themselves, you know, and talking about their business. And that is like one of the first hacks. And I'm going to go into that in just a second. But is that look at your email. And how many times have you said the word I versus <laughs> the word you? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I or we or, or however you want to call it versus you. And if you can simply change your emails so that you are saying the writing the word you or your maybe twice as much as you're writing the word I. Oh, okay. That is immediately going to have a huge impact on the chances of somebody responding to it psychologically too people yeah. take those inputs without being conscious of it absolutely, absolutely. in a very yeah. negative way or positive if you use you mm -hmm. and and i assume you're saying eventually you want to get to we 
you know? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. your end game, right? But you got to go yes. to get to you first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, think about looking at your email inbox. You see a bunch of emails that are coming that's saying like, you know, hi, Paul, I, X, Y, Z, I, I, I. And you see one that says, hi, Paul, you know, your website mentions this and this and this. And and I also saw that your LinkedIn mentions this. Like, you're just going to kind of lean into that. Like, wait, what is this about? This person's this person knows something about me. You know, they're curious. They're they're they've done some research on me. Yes. You know, and whether or not they respond to it, that's another thing. It's not it's not as simple as just saying you at the start. Although that's a great hack. Just starting starting the email with you puts you off in the right foot or puts you on in the right or starts you off on the right foot. But yeah. Um, yeah, the I starting off with I is immediately kind of a signal to the person that like, oh, this is something about them. It's not something about me. And ultimately, we are our own uh, favorite subject, <laughs> you know, ourselves. So if we oh, see that, hey, this person is writing about my favorite subject. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, it's funny. Sometimes I get all those emails and uh, messages and they say, hello, um, you know, I, I had a look at your profile, LinkedIn profile, so I think that I can help you. But then could you please tell me a little bit about your business? Mm -hmm. And that's so funny, you know, because I thought, okay, so if you have, maybe, you know, there are two issues there. One of them, of course, is probably the, uh, my, the explanation of my business there is not clear enough for them. But then also uh, they haven't, also the second one is that they haven't done um, enough research, you know, if they're asking mm -hmm. me, Tell them about uh, my business or about myself mm. or whatever. So I don't know. This is really something um, uh, multi-layered. Uh, I think I feel that it is not really that simple. So as you mm -hmm. say, of course, we need to use the word you, you um, twice as much as we use the word I. But still, mm -hmm. uh, there I think that there are certain questions where which are probably not that good to ask mm -hmm. in such emails when you um, mm -hmm. when you address the other person. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I, I just want. Can I jump in? Just um, yeah, looking at like some of the uh, messages I get on LinkedIn. Um, it, it, the ones that are most effective is. They reference something. Oh, Tim, I read your article, or mm -hmm. I, I, or preferably they may be interacted on a post I made, right? So mm -hmm. they, I feel that some, you know, even, even if it's not research. And then the second thing is if they jump to selling, trying to sell me something on the first, on the first <laughs> date, they're, they're trying to kiss me and, and I want them to bring me flowers, you know? Yes. I, I, I want, I want them to say, oh, you know, you're whatever. I'm interested in your subject matter or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they're trying to approach me as a human rather than just a target to sell something to. Yeah. Know, is that, is that, is, does that represent other people? Oh, well, I mean, I can see Maya nodding and I would say, absolutely. It represents me as well. I, and again, it just comes back to that sense that we have of like, is this person seeing me as a dollar sign? Or are they seeing me as someone that they could potentially collaborate with in solving some type of problem that I have or working with me in some way or, you know, and I, I really like the dating analogy as well. You know, I think a lot of times we, we, we or it, you know, it doesn't even have to be dating necessarily. It could even be just trying to make a friend. Are you going to walk up to somebody and say, hey, do you want to hang out next week? You mm -hmm. know, the chances of someone you don't know saying, yeah, let's hang out. I can't wait. Like, the chances of that happening are so slim. Yeah. Whereas if you were to walk up to somebody and talk to them a little bit, ask them a couple questions, mm -hmm. you know, and have them ask you a couple questions, maybe chances of that person saying, sure, let's hang out next week. It is vastly higher. It, it doesn't mean they're going to say yes, but vastly, vastly higher. And so many people will just go right in with that. Hey, basically asking you to hang out next week when you have never even talk to them before you've never said anything you don't even you have no idea who they are um yeah uh maya your your um point about um the the research and and also the questions i mean i think that you would probably agree that in terms of the research it doesn't actually have to be perfect mm -hmm. you know I, I i don't expect somebody to 
know my business through and through and everything about it. And I'm sure you're the same. But at the same time, if someone comes to me and says, like, can you tell me a bit about your business? That's so broad and, yeah. and vague that like, well, where should I start? Like, like what, do you, what do you what are you what are you looking for? And, and again, I, I think that we can if, if they just take five minutes, 10 minutes to, mm -hmm. you know, look at my website or look at your website, they can get a sense of what it is that you do and they can actually ask you some specific questions um, that, you know, don't have to be deep questions at all, but could actually reference something that's on your website, you know? Like, hey, mm. Maya, I noticed that you have this every Wednesday and you also do the political uh, talk every Sunday, you know? Just even mentioning something like that shows that, hey, they actually looked at, looked at what I'm <laughs> doing. <laughs> um, in this day and age, it's not hard to gather information on people. So, uh, yeah, right. great, but great, great points and, and, and questions. Any, any other thoughts before we keep going? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think strategic targeting is um, very useful to be able to prioritize because you can waste your time on a lot of prospects that maybe it's a low chance, for example, that they'll ever use your mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And that gives you more time to maybe do a little bit more research mm -hmm. on the more targeted companies that you prioritize. Does that make sense? Like totally that skill to, you know, yeah. prioritize. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I call that a ideal client, like kind of knowing who your ideal client is and focusing in on those people, those ideal clients, they probably have similar issues. They probably have similar day to days. They maybe work in similar sized companies. They have similar markets that they're trying to work in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they're still individuals and, you know, there's specific things you can find out about all of them. But if you're playing inside of that same target market that you know and understand, and that takes time, like, you know, it might take you a while to really figure out, hey, what is my target market? Um, but once you know that, you can use all of that information in your emails as well. And then if you pepper in a little bit of specific information about the person, they're going to be like, wow, this person knows a bit about me they get the sense of what my mission is and my market. Mm -hmm. And all of those things start building up into someone saying, yeah, this is worth my time to speak to this person. So um, yeah, yeah, that's a whole other topic about yeah, ideal yeah. customers. Yes. Okay, Maya, can you pull up that uh, email? Okay, so a couple other things I'm gonna mention really quickly before we go on. One is that this is just a bit of a long email. <laughs> you know, and it's fine sending emails that are this long to people that you know. Although at the same time, I find sometimes that if I receive something that's very long from somebody, I'm like, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second because, you know, maybe I don't, I'm not ready to write a long email back. And then I kind of maybe forget about that for a little bit. So just in general, we're all getting so accustomed to short messages through texting, through messaging. The shorter you can make your message, the more chances are that someone will give you a response, a quick response. Um, and then, Tim, you kind of mentioned something about this. The final thing about this email is down at the bottom, already going into what things cost and, you know, like what service. And it's just like, I don't know you. I'm sorry. I'm not sure who you are. So to get that far, uh, I would have to be just at the absolutely perfect, exact perfect time. <laughs> where yeah. it's like wow this email has all the information that i need yeah not not great chances the wolves are at your door kind of situation like you're desperate yeah yes yeah okay so let's move on to some ways to improve things and this is a just a fantastic um i guess there's a post on linkedin that i saved and mm -hmm. uh this is a great person to follow if you want to learn more about um cold emails about two years ago started an AI-based company that is called Lavender. And mm. Lavender is a very, very hot uh, startup at the moment. I guess they may be getting a little bit past the startup phase. But uh, they help people write better emails. They will basically score your email based off of all of this information to say like, hey, yeah, this, you know, this is what you could do to improve it. This is based off of other emails. This is what you could potentially do to alter it in a positive way. So I recommend following this person or, or checking them out. Um, but as he says, until you get a reply to your cold email, 
the only goal of your cold email is to get a reply and right. optimize. Yeah. Optimize for starting a conversation. You know, exactly. he says not booking time, but I think it could be not, you know, getting them to buy something, not whatever, but optimize for starting a conversation with somebody. You know, Okay, that's really a great point, because I think that and it also ties up uh, to this, uh, well, what you said and Tim said in the beginning of this episode that at the end of the day, these emails are co are cold cold emails because there there have been no conversation before and we want mm -hmm. to start that conversation so that we can kind of ease into the relationship or create exactly. that relationship yeah. with the person uh yes. we want to talk with and work with yes totally I, I i when i changed my emailing strategy to basically following this um and and I'm going to go into some ways specifically to do this, um, but it, it completely changed my ability to open new doors and mm -hmm. get people mm -hmm. to feel comfortable responding to me, a complete stranger, like someone who they absolutely do not know. And in a sea of emails where people are vying for your attention and trying to get into your wallet, actually having them feel comfortable to respond. And uh, yeah, if you can just get that conversation started, it makes all the difference and compared to, you know, the Hail Mary, I'm going to try and get all the information out there. I'm going to share everything um, and, and maybe hope that something sticks. So that's kind of the biggest overarching thing that I recommend. Look at your emails. Are you trying to start a conversation with someone or are you trying to do more than that? Because the most simple bar is getting a reply. And if you can get in that conversation, good things can happen down the road. Um, so, I mean, the, you might kind of wonder, well, r right off the bat, how can you do this? And in my opinion, we've already talked about it a little bit, but it's all about personalization and relevance, mm -hmm. you know, sending an email that is personalized to somebody, you know, meaning that when I say personalized, it is for them and them only. If somebody else got that email, it wouldn't make sense. No, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. know, like if someone else got the email, they'd be like, this must have been sent to the wrong place. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not this person. And you know, the way that you could personalize things is looking on their LinkedIn profile, digging into their work history. Maybe, you know, one of my favorite ways to personalize an email to somebody that I don't know is I look at where they are now and I look at what they used to do. And I will just kind of look, okay, interesting. So, you know, um, this person, they're now a VP at this particular company. And previously they were a manager at another company, you know, so they, they had a pretty big transition at some point. If that transition was recently, maybe like this is a huge time of change for them, you know, that they, this new transition has happened, or maybe they've become an entrepreneur recently. I didn't even necessarily have to ask a question about it, but I could just mention, you know, I've noticed that you've made the jump from X, Y, Z to this recently. Um, you know, I'm, I, I wish the best must might've been a bumpy transition or it might've been a challenge uh, or just something like that, where it's just letting them know that I've done a little bit of research on them, you know, that I, I've, I've, I've checked them out and uh, yeah, I've taken some extra time. And, and it also shows them that, Hey, this couldn't be sent to anybody else. And there will be a little thing that goes off in their mind that reminds them that it makes them think, okay, interesting. This isn't, you know, a total spam email here. This is a real human being on the other side who sent me this. Um, another great place I have to say that you can put your personalization stuff is actually towards the end of the email in like the PS area. If you're, if you have something, if there's something about the person that's totally not business related, but you want to mention it, Let's say that they live in like Fukuoka and, and you used to live there, or you've recently gone there. You can put that at the PS at the bottom. Hey, by the way, saw that you live in Toronto. I actually grew up there. You know, my favorite place to get a Jamaican patty is here or something like that. Totally not business related, but it, it's that little piece that's in there that shows, hey, you know, I, I did take a look at your profile. I've, I've done a bit of research on you. And I have to say that little PS thing at the bottom especially if you have a good email above it, it can really, uh, I, I found it to be a pretty effective way to get people to show that I'm a human being who's, you know, trying to connect with you. Yeah. Um, 
On the other side, relevance. And this is where kind of what Tim was saying a moment ago, you know, knowing your customers, that's what that's really all about is being able to show that you understand maybe what this business is about or what their market is or, or what they're trying to um, achieve. Uh, so what that means is maybe understanding the specific challenges that their market has, or if they're in a particular role, like for example, that VP role that I just mentioned, and you see that they've recently started at a new company, maybe in the past six months or a year. If you really know your market, you probably know that there are common things that are going on for that person. You know, actually a great example would be here in Japan, an international hire that's maybe been hired um, recently and brought to Japan. I mean, there's a slew of challenges that that person might be dealing with coming into a completely new culture. Um, their boss as well probably is aware of those challenges. And if you see that they are hiring people from overseas, you could speak to very relevant problems that their staff might be feeling. And you know, it, it, if you're able to bring those two things together, personalization plus relevance, it's a potent way to get people to take notice of you. Yeah, I'll pause there for a sec. <laughs> yes, James, I was wondering, so um, basically we're talking about uh, sending emails to potential business partners uh, mm -hmm. because, right, uh, am I understanding you correctly? Yes. Yeah, I so, mean, I would say that's the most common way that, I, that we would use this, yeah. Right. Okay. Because sometimes I was thinking probably it's a it's a good point to I mean to make this differentiate or this difference because when we send if somebody wants to send uh, you know emails uh, like selling things to a large number of people as at the end customers for example mm -hmm. maybe the, you know the approach uh, would be different uh, but even though um, what I wanted to say is that even when we write to people potential business customers which is you know in old let's say maybe maybe old fashion terms it is uh, categorized as a business to business uh, mm -hmm. approach then mm -hmm. we still probably we need to think that uh, it's more than just business to business it's what you said you know it's person to person um, mm -hmm. like human to human yeah. and that's what we need to remember actually when we uh, well let's say write those emails and uh, send them out and uh, so on mm -hmm. so james to big time big time yeah, I absolutely, Maya. Um, to to kind of like maybe add a little Japanese flavor to this discussion. Is that okay? Can I? Oh, please. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, I had a dilemma when I was in sales in the U.S. and this was back in the early '90s. And uh, so my job was to develop business with Japanese transplants, which I've mentioned mm -hmm. before. Okay, and. At the time, the Japanese were running the show in most of these companies. So I had to figure out a way to approach them. And it's even harder to cold call with the Japanese. There's got to be. So I kind of let's call it a lukewarm approach. OK. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. lukewarm approach was Jetro had an office in Chicago. Hmm. And Jetro, one of their missions was to promote localization of Japanese components and products because there was a lot of political backlash. So they were there mm -hmm. for that purpose, right? Which aligned with my purpose, right? Because mm -hmm. I had to, I wanted to develop. I'm working mm -hmm. for this American company. Yeah. So I approached Jetro and I took them golfing and I asked them, there was a list of all, they gave me a list of all the Japanese factories in in all of the Midwest, right? Hmm. And with, you know, a little description of what they make or what service they're into. And I got to know them, you know, just, I, I only met them a couple of times. And I said, if I contact these companies, can I say that you, Mr. Hmm. Tanaka in Jetro referred me? Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, right? Mm. That was my in. I created... Oh, yeah a lukewarm connection but it was a highly legitimate source right mm -hmm. yeah and then my next step 
by, by this time, I had given a lot of seminars. And in all my seminars, I would always ask Japanese Americans to list what they like and what they don't like about each other, right? Mm-hmm. And I found a pattern. No matter where I went to, they were kind of saying there was a lot of overlap in what they said, right? Yes. So when I approached this one client and I got the job. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in the header, I, I wrote, you know, uh, so-and-so from Jetro it, it, it referred me to, mm-hmm. to get them to open yeah. the right right yeah yeah and then i had a name and i said you know do you, do your americans say this 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 and this mm. and do your japanese say this 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 these yeah. are this is indicative of deeper culture gaps and that's what i do i would love to sit down and talk to you maybe we can help each other out i mean that was yeah that's, i don't I remember mean, that- details right so i mean yeah that sounds first of all just having that referral to get in is is key and then leveraging that at the start of the email if you have that use it i mean that's fantastic but then also yeah you're showing them that hey i know you i know your business you're showing them that you know them you know and even though you don't know them know them you're showing them that hey i i understand i think i understand at least what's going on and uh yeah thank you for sharing that that's that's uh that's a ideal way of using something like this for sure yeah and then um, just just one more quick note about that particular job so i go in for my presentation based on that email and it's a mixed japanese american audience yeah and after i give my presentation one of the americans he was trying to i don't know what's the word he was trying to get me with a gotcha question right and the, his question was how are you going to solve our problem? That's what I want to know. Mm. And I said, my job is not to solve your problem. You guys have to solve your own problems. My mm. job is to define the problem so you understand what needs to be done. And it starts with your leadership. Mm. So I can't, solve, nobody, only you can solve. And in the back, the Japanese president is nodding his head. Because wow. <laughs> Japanese, Japanese always say you have to define the problem before you try to solve it, right? Right. My point was wow, like, I don't know what your problems are yet, you know, but I'll help you define them, you know. It really so. takes something to, to to respond in that way with, you know, I got to say, so good for you. That's that's that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> that was my, one of my first big success stories. So I learned a lot from that. I also made a lot of mistakes too, but um, I learned oh. a lot from that. We yeah. all do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, go ahead. Okay, here. Let's go. Let's go through. We'll go through just a few quick tips. And again, this is this is emailing in twenty. What is it? Twenty twenty three now. So emailing in twenty twenty three. I mean, this is very much the case. And I'm gonna actually show you why in a second. But keep your subject line short. If you're sending an email to someone, especially when you don't know them, you're trying to you know get that initial conversation started. A short subject line is the most effective thing. I encourage you to check out your spam folder. I bet you that most of those subject lines are longer yeah, because they're trying to entice you to open. I actually love to use the example of my dad. Whenever he emails me, he basically always use, uses the same subject line, which is hi, bud. Hi, bud. Ah. That's the subject line. Hi, bud. And the reason I use that example is because usually with people that we know when we email back and forth, and we can always tell when it's an email that comes through from someone that we know, you know, we can always tell, oh yeah, because like the subject line, often it is much more casual. It's usually shorter. It might not use capitalization, you know, in every place that it should, you know, obviously I highly encourage you to capitalize names and things like that. But it's not overly formal. And I would really recommend, you know, keeping your subject line short, try not to be overly formal with them. People's names work really well. Like if I was sending one to Maya, I could just literally write like Maya dash um, Japan insights or something like that, you know, or J E I or, or something like that. Just a short little subject line. 
those short subject lines, they stick out like a sore thumb in an inbox. Wow. <laughs> an inbox full of like advertisements. Short subject lines are like, what is that? You know, they there's something about it. It, it breaks a pattern that we usually have looking at our inbox. So one, one that I totally recommend, reply rates do tend to be higher when you have those shorter subject lines, okay? Yes, Yeah. great. Another one, short emails, definitely better than long emails, okay? And I would say that, you know, the shorter, the better. And there's, I'm gonna show you this data point in just a second, um, but, I recognize it. It's not that easy to send a short email. Like you'll find if you try to write an email, especially a sales email to someone that you don't know, trying to get them to take a meeting with you or, or trying to get them to, you know, trying to start a conversation with them. Less than a hundred words is a real challenge. Um, I, when I worked uh, at a particular company about, again, about five years ago, when I kind of changed the whole way that I, I started emailing or that, that I emailed, um, I just, gave myself a challenge that for the next month, I'm not gonna send an email to anyone that is longer than a hundred words. And it was really tough, but that was one of the best months that I ever had for opening new doors. And it just kind of flipped mm -hmm. this switch in my mind of like, wow. And the, the reasons here are, it's easier to read this. It's easier to read the message. I'm not sure if anyone else is like this, but skimming, it's something yeah. that we all do, you know, we skim, we skim, skim, yeah. skim. skim. Yeah. yeah, you know what, actually, there's a, there's a slight aside, right now I'm studying for the N3, I'm taking the N3 in about 10 days, and, oh. uh, on, uh, yeah, 10, 10 or 11 days, and uh, that skimming that I do in English, I'm not, I'm not good at doing that in Japanese, to be very oh. clear. <laughs> Yeah, I find myself. Hard, hard I, find, yeah, yeah. I find yeah. myself. I find myself just like naturally trying to skim because that's how I read in English, and then I have to really stop myself and be like, "No, dude, like you really need to slow down and like focus in <laughs> on this because you you are not good enough to skim uh, these these passages." Yeah. Um, but then, James, so, you know, it also yeah. means that once you master Japanese. Um, so maybe you'll be able to do that in Japanese as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, I'd, li I'd like to get to that point. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing too is like, we're just familiar to short text messages. You know, like we know short messages, we send them all the time. And if you see that short email, uh, as I say here, I believe it's easier to reply to. Yeah. You know, a short message from someone means it's also a signal saying you can send a short message back to me i'm not expecting you to send a long message whereas mm. you know i'm sure that we've all before gotten a long message from someone maybe that we know and we're like okay do i do i have to send a really long message back now i mean and maybe i just don't want to at this particular time i don't want to send a, a really right. long message back yes. so yeah. easier to reply to and lastly it drives curiosity thinking back to that long message from the, I think the tax accountant that I, I shared earlier. I mean, that just gives so much information. There's nothing for me as the buyer to sit there being like, hey, I wonder about this. I oh, wonder yeah. about that. They've, they've given me everything. They gave me who they are, what they do, why they do it, you know, when they started, what they charge. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I've gotten all the information I need. I, I don't, even if I'm interested, it's almost like I hold all the cards at that point. Mm -hmm um right so yeah yeah just the other day tim and i was talking about a very long message from somebody on linkedin and it was so difficult to go through it and to sift you know and find the most important points there it was yeah these points are really very 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 good i can say <laughs> You know, the yeah. funny thing, James, is that I also thought uh, because, um, yeah, the books we get a lot of, I mean, we get to read, right? Everybody reads books. Mm -hmm. But I was um, recently thinking while reading one of the books that I do need the most important points, a summary of that, because the book what which I was reading and thinking about, you know, these important points was a kind of, um, I mean, interesting it's interesting but you don't need all that information there you know in order to get uh, bullet points at the end and yeah. to 
your point that we have uh, gotten used to short messages uh, via uh, social media platforms and uh, also the messaging services and so on is so relevant and so important and we all have to be aware of it when mm -hmm. we uh, yeah when we send emails and when we just message or even when we write books <laughs> yeah, i would yeah. <laughs> oh the, the I, sheer, yeah, the sheer I volume of information messages yeah. coming at at us makes yeah. it impossible if they were all long messages we we wouldn't have time to read it all so we almost have to shorten it into quicker digestible things other you know because of all that coming at us totally totally you know one of, one of the things to consider about this i'm not sure if anyone's ever had this experience before as well but where you're emailing somebody potentially even at your company who is you know above you let's say you're emailing your ceo or um you know you're emailing you know a high ranking person they tend to respond in very short messages from what I've found. Even if I've written, you know, a few sentences, I will get back just like a yes <laughs> or something yeah. like that, you know, and or just a few words. And I again, I think that there's a a like a psychological piece to writing the short messages. It shows that, you know, you've got think you've got a bunch of things going on. You are a busy person as well. Maybe you are a person of like a higher rank, you know, so having those those uh, shorter messages, there's plenty of reasons why it makes uh, a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. James, so we also have Yuka in Clubhouse. Yuka, hello. Good evening. So I think that she's got a comment or a question to you. Uh, if you don't mind uh, listening, Great. hearing what uh, she wants to share with us. Yuka. Hi, thank you, James. This has been a great session. I'm so impressed with, you know, you have a wealth of you know, great uh, tips. But uh, mm -hmm. I have a quick question, actually two of those. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind, can we go back to the subject line? Because I was thinking, you know, let's say I did all, you know, I have taken all the suggestions that you have given us, and then I have written the greatest, you know, introduction email for myself but if i got if i get the wrong subject line everything is going to be thrown out the door right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and you said it's got to be you know the small the short the subject line and let's say you know they say like a, somebody's you know sending me an email for the first time and they say hi yuka but these days unfortunately i think ai has listened to you and you know i think mm -hmm. ai knew sometimes they, they do that even though those are mass produced email so can we add a little bit of little bit of the color like a, um like a, you know i was just thinking maybe introducing yuka is just too obvious you know that i don't know this person mm -hmm. do can we sort of incorporate a little bit of like a, things that i do or that's that's no no well i mean first of all i would say that for any of these things Yuka, I highly recommend just experimentation, you know, so there's no absolutely perfect way to do any of these things. I would say that so long as you're keeping that subject line fairly short, and it, by the way, like it doesn't have to be one to three words, it could be longer. And by the way, it could work to send a longer, just a much longer one as well. There's no, you know, perfect way to do it. Um, one way that I would say you can absolutely, I believe, do what you're talking about there is let's say that you see something on their website or from their um, LinkedIn that jumps out to you, uh, that you've noticed, you could maybe put that in brackets beside your subject line. So, you know, so it could say something like, uh, you know, Maya, uh, J-E-I or, or whatever, as I was saying before, or even simply Maya, and then in brackets beside it, um, or in, you know, something beside it on, on the subject line, mentioning something from their LinkedIn, you know, and I, I don't have uh, Maya's LinkedIn open right now, but I think that doing something like that, adding that little bit of personal flair, or even adding um, something from your side, you know, one thing that I actually would do if, if, if I was reaching out to people who are far away from where I was, I would sometimes put in brackets like James from Toronto, in brackets, because it's just like kind of the person might be like, oh, okay, who's James from Toronto? It's just like a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit um, out of the box. So does, does that answer your question, Yuka, and what you're you're thinking? 
Yes, no, that's great. I was thinking, hmm, you come from, where should I use? I was just thinking, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay. So, the, yeah, let, let me move on to the second question, which is, okay, so I have a fragile ego. So mm. I do everything to avoid getting a no. So, you know, so for that kind of person, let's say if I send, you know, a, an, an email once and then I don't mm. hear anything from this person, like, mm. should I try second time with the same email or, you know, like a, how, how often or how long should I just keep on, you know, trying to reaching out to this same person? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a great question. And it's actually going to go into, um, in some ways, my next slide as well. But first, I'm going to say that I personally think, yes, you should reach out to them again. On average, in, again, in this day and age, this data is from a few years ago, but it's probably even longer now. It takes, on average, five to seven attempts to, um, let's say, open a new door at a company so there isn't any perfect way to you know get that first strike and it's great when it works when the first email gets sent and they're interested but it does take multiple attempts generally how long should you wait in between each attempt that really comes down to your personal preference um i i like to think of it you know how would i like to be like how would how would i like to be reached out if someone, if a salesperson was reaching out to me, how would I like it to go? I wouldn't particularly like it if it's like every single day they're emailing me, okay? But I have had instances where someone has sent me an email, I've looked at it and I've been like, okay, this is maybe kind of interesting, but not enough for me to respond. And then maybe another email comes through three or four days later, and it's just a follow-up email that is a different email, but it's still maybe short. Maybe it's giving me a little bit more information. Maybe it's sharing a piece of content that they have that could be applicable to me. Something like that, where I'm like, oh, you know what? There is somebody over there who seems like they're actually trying to get in touch with me. So, you know, th that's what I would consider is think about how you would like someone to reach out to you and do it in that way. If that's your, whatever, you know, that style is, uh, there's a great book called um, Sell the Way You Buy. And, and that's really the most natural way that you can sell is if you can think about how do I like to buy things? If someone was to do this to me, how would I like it? And that's probably going to be the most natural way for you to reach out to them. Um, I'll also say on the fragile, <laughs> fragile ego piece, you're definitely not alone. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, takes one to know one. I mean, I certainly do as well, and I've, I've I've done a lot of work on it to try and, you know, not have a fragile ego, but I I still do definitely from time to time, and you know that's just something that exposure therapy I think does wonders for it. The more that you kind of put that ego to the fire, uh, the better. Um, so I will that that that's a little piece of advice for me for there. Now, but before we. Uh, before we wrap up, and this is still applicable um, to Yuka's question there, can you pull up that last slide for me, um, Maya? Yes, here we go. Okay, so this is a call to action and I'll kind of speak to Yuka here specifically. And I call them a soft, let, I wanna compare two things, a soft call to action versus a hard call to action. So a soft call to, or sorry, a um, very common way that someone does a call to action, which is basically making your ask in an email, a very common way that it's done is, when are you free to talk about this? Can I get 20 minutes to discuss this with you? Would Wednesday, September 13th at 3 p.m. work for a call? Mm -hmm. Very specific, very much like a yes or a no question. Give me your answer what like what's it going to be can i you know is this going to work uh that will put your ego very much to that fire that fragile ego because the person can easily come back and say no or they will just probably ignore you because they don't know who you are so you know the chances of them saying yeah sure i'm free like let's do it it's just such a high bar that the person has to jump over a way more effective way is to do a soft call to action, which is basically, you know, asking them, what are your thoughts? Is this something that you're interested in? 
you know, um, uh, would you be open to exchange a couple of emails about this? You know, just a much lower bar. And I actually have an example. Um, this, uh, uh, I'm just gonna, in the mess, essence of time, I'm just gonna give you a very quick example of one of these emails with that soft call to action at the bottom, okay? This one here, any interest in learning more? You know, to me, that type of question at the end, rather than that hard, hey, are you, uh, are you ready to meet me? This type of thing, any interest in learning more, it opens the door that maybe there is no interest, you know? And you can also play around with this email a bit and say something at the end like, um, you know, are you opposed to learning more about this? Is this something you're not interested in? You know, you can do various things like, like that at the end, but it is just a much softer way to finish that email, okay? By the way, I will go through this email a little bit here. Um, first off, we're starting with something that's very personalized. I'm, this is an imaginary person, Ken, who uh, does, um, I think the, the business that I created is that they basically help businesses who bring in international hires to um, you know, adapt to working in Japan. So Ken, your website mentions you're looking for international new hires. Have you ever found that non-Japanese hires can get frustrated while adapting to work culture in Japan? I'm sure that could be more specific and better for people who know that um, a little bit more than I do. And then maybe at the end there, we help Acme Corp increase their retention rate of new hires by 40% using our Japanese culture training. Any interest in learning more? You know, this is a short email. It mentions a problem. It also is very specific to something that's on their website that I saw. And then at the end, hey, any interest? Yes, no? Anyway, Tim, what are your thoughts? Oh, oh Tim, you I was saying that was under 50 words. So that's great. That's a good it one. Is. Yes. <laughs> right to the point. Yeah, very good. I like it. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, uh, cool. yeah. Well, I, am I the only one? Like, I, tr I tend to start off messages or emails with, you know, I loved your post or mm -hmm. on blah, blah, blah. Or I caught your interview on, yeah. you know, this uh, podcast or again it's about you but it's pretty short and it's you're referencing something specific and i think people like to know that others are interested in them you know oh totally and i mean and, and, actually, and, sorry right can you pull the slide back up for a, a quick yes. moment Maya? yeah sure. so this is the framework that i've used okay yeah. so that what you just mentioned there that line one yeah. Personalization relevance. By the way, if anyone wants these slides and I have a few extra, I, I'm more than happy, a few other ones to add. I'm more than happy to send them over. So just hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, but that first line there is just personalization and relevance. It could absolutely be, Tim, hey, Tim, loved your post about uh, Karumi doing, not doing the dishes or whatever. Are you doing the dishes? <laughs> that one. Yeah, right. which is a great, which is a great article. I like that one about your uh, doing the dishes. Um, <laughs> And uh, anyway, and then, you know, secondly, what's a problem that they're dealing with? Third, what is it that you do about it? How do you bring value to people who are in those situations? And then at the end, some type of soft call to action, like thoughts, you know, any interest? Um, have you considered this? That nice. type of thing. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah, I agree. That's appealing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it's really an important framework and <clears throat> to everybody who is watching or will be watching uh, from now on because some people watch during the week and later. So please remember that you can connect with uh, James on LinkedIn. If you haven't connected yet, you can uh, message him uh, there. Please keep your messages short. And uh, <laughs> <you> know, yes. <laughs> But yes, James uh, offered uh, to share these slides with you, uh, probably in a... Uh, PDF file or PP or PowerPoint. So if you want them, uh, please do. Okay, connect with them. So thank you, yeah. James. <laughs> All okay, right. Yeah, that's really funny. You may, yeah. Uh, 
This is really fun. Thank you, as always. It's yeah. a great time, so I appreciate it. I think we got to do it again. We just can't. There's so much to talk about. I think we should There's do it. so much to talk about, and I'm sure that there are even more things that we can learn. Uh, you can teach us, actually, James. So thank you very much for uh, your time this morning and yeah. Uh, yeah. for being open to sharing your uh, insights, yeah. your knowledge with us and with the audiences here. Uh, so thank you. And to everybody who's stuck with us, we are very, yes, yes, uh, okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> we are grateful for your attention and time. And we'll be here once again on Sunday morning with the Japanese Politics One-on-One -on -one with Timothy Langley and next week at eight o'clock on Wednesday morning. So um, please uh, join us again at that time. Well, James, again, thanks a lot uh, for your time. And if you have a few words in conclusion, please uh, go ahead and uh, let us know. Or thoughts. any personal plugs. This is where you can get yes. your <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. No, I mean, I uh, as, as a personal plug, I will say that my wife and I work in real estate here in Yokohama. So if anyone needs help with uh, um, buying or, or selling homes in Yokohama, please feel free to reach out. On the other yes. side, if anyone needs a hand with... Uh, um, sales and you know whether that's from business development to you know things further down the line i'm more than happy to really just have a discussion with anyone about those things so let me know um hit me up on linkedin and i'd be happy to uh to connect all right but that's all right. it for now thanks so much for having me this is always such a great time i'm looking yeah. forward to the next one thank you so very much james okay so this will be the time for us to uh complete the the session